Well, we've been gone a couple weeks with uh, Passover and all that good stuff. Um, okay, now let's, by way of review, just, just a quick overview, timeline-wise. Um, the numbers, what I've got up here is it's altered a little bit now. You'll see the numbers as the chapters that are white. And then the ones that aren't chapters but are blue, I've kind of done that to the um, judgments numbers. So that, um, for instance, when we get into the seals, hopefully you can read those. Although one of them looks like it's stubbornly staying white, but that's okay. You know, it's its privilege, right? <laughs> um, and then the by the trumpets and the bowls, that way they're not getting all confused up together. So, chapters one through three. Chapter chapter one. What generally happens in chapter one? Who wants to volunteer that? Oh, I'm putting you on the spot. Chapter 1 starts us off with John on the island of Patmos, and he gets a visit from Jesus, right? And then remember verse 19, which we covered last time, is our outline verse for the things that John, are supposed, John is supposed to write down. Write down the things that were... And that could be, I like the idea of that being the Gospel of John. So write down the things that were, because they don't know exactly when he wrote down John, and it could be on Patmos, and it could be as a result of this. The things that are, and that's uh, chapters 2 and 3, the church age. And then write down the things that are after these, Meditata. And after these, the after these things, which picks up in, after the churches, picks up in chapter 4 and 5, and he finds himself in the throne room of heaven. And then, of course, um, in chapter 6, chapter 6, uh, it's revealed to John the seal judgments. And then um, we find ourselves with kind of a parenthetic in chapter 7, what happens in chapter 7. I just let you guys off the hook big time for a lot of that. What's... <laughs> mm -hmm. The 144,000. Right, so that's a parenthetical, right? And then, from that parenthetical, what is the odd thing that, that happens with the seventh seal? Remember the... So it goes into the next... The trumpet, trumpet. Very good, right. Yes, you're both correct. The seventh seal opens up the trumpet judgments. So, but really we had a, a prelude that happened um, right before the trumpets, and then we launched into the trumpets. And one of the most confounding and confusing chapters for Bible expositors, chapter 9, and um, what we looked at with uh, chapter 9 was a bunch of weird demonic activity going on. So we had these strange critters come up and these um, beasts that came upon the world. And we're going to continue in that vein because what happens with... Um, beginning in, in the trumpet judgments are these woes. There's three different woes that happens, and each of the woes are different judgments from the rest of the, the seals and the trumpets and the bowls, and they all have a directly satanic slash demonic type of a um, theme to them, if I can put it that way. 
So then we find ourselves after those creatures and we find um, at, at the very end of chapter 9, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and that they did not repent of the murders of their sorceries or their uh, sexual immorality and their thefts. So, let me go like this here. So, we're going to work our way through the rest of... Uh, what happened here with the trumpets in that we find ourselves at another interlude here. Um, look at chapter 10 of Revelation. Now this one for a lot of people is very frustrating and I understand that and I have always been for the longest time been among that number that's been kind of aggravated by the first part of chapter 10 because it seems like an anti-spoiler. You know, you read in here and something happens and then it kind of gets yanked away from us. I don't know if you've ever watched, you ever had a, a favorite TV series going and you thought it was pretty good. It was going really well and all of this, but apparently it was going too well and it's too nice a TV show or something like that. So they canceled it and you're saying, no, wait, they left it, man. They left me at a cliffhanger. I don't even know how it's going to end. And they canceled the TV show. And of course the junk keeps going, right? The junky TV shows, they just... Keep renewing those. Well, this was kind of like the former where, you know, you get part way in there and, and John hears the thunders start to say something and then he's told, no, 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 don't write that down. And you wonder, wait, what? What was that about? So we're going to examine some of that because we have some clues. I think, uh, in, in my humble opinion, I think we do have some clues about what exactly is was going on and um let me work this thing through and click on something here and get us going let's go ahead and read through it real quick that's probably the the uh, best thing to do i saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with the cloud and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Now, before we, we get into there, I want to set this up because I don't want to want you to go in with, with any confusion there. A lot of times people will say that this angel is probably Jesus. But in verse 1 where it says... Um, I saw still another mighty angel. There are two words for that we would use in place of another in the Greek. And I think we had this example before in a former chapter. There's um, the word for heteros, which means a, a completely different type of angel. And there's alos, which means of the same kind. Well, this Chapter 10, verse 1, is Alice. So it means this is another of the same kind of angels that we've been seeing before. So this isn't something new. This isn't, you know, the Messiah, Jesus, standing on the shore. So with that in mind, it doesn't identify him. Um, but we can take a look at another passage that reads very similar and see if we think it might be the same angel. So, but I digress. Chap chapter 10, verse 2. He had a little book open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Strange posture, right? And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, 
who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then, this was the part you were talking about earlier, Jeannie, the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. I think this is kind of funny. He's telling John, hey, go get that, go take that little book out of that big old fiery angel's hands. So John, so he says, I went to the angel and said to him, um, give me the little book. <laughs> so he didn't take it. It's like, can, can I have it, please? Um, and he said to me, take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. All right, so that concludes our study for the night. <laughs> Doesn't really quite add up. Okay, so uh, just by, by review, let's uh, re-examine the those uh, odd parentheticals again in the in the book because we didn't really go through all of them. But the um, parenthetical sections are um, chapter seven, verses one to seventeen, chapter ten through chapter eleven, verse three. Um, chapters 12 through about verse, or ch through chapter 14, about verse 20, you know, there's sections in there, and you'll find parentheticals kind of mixed in to make things more confusing. Um, and then chapter 17 is a parenthetical, and uh, in my humble opinion, it's chapter 20 that is the parenthetical. A lot of times people will have chapter 21 as the parenthetical, and I don't think so. When we get there, we'll go into the reasons why. And I know I've voiced some of that before. And then um, chapter 22 um, is a, a parenthetical because it's it's John wrapping things up. Um, in a sort of interlude between the sixth trumpet and the seventh, John's carried away in a vision um, to this shore where he encounters a mighty angel. John gets carried away in these little parentheticals. It's almost like John's been given a break between these big events because the seventh seal opens up the trumpets. Then you get to the seventh trumpet. It starts the bowls and it seems God likes to prepare John each time a little bit, give him a break, give him a little bit of an object lesson and then say, now John, you gonna be okay? Dust him off a little bit, you know, brush the Debris off his shoulders and say, okay, now get ready because things are about to get serious now. It's going to get worse. You ready? <laughs> you know? So he does this to him. So, so here he encounters this mighty angel. Um, and let's just look at the next part of this. So... Uh, let's see. He had a little scroll open his hand, his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Um, that's it. Like I said before, it's an odd posture. Why, why do you think that's in there like that? Don't you think that's an odd thing, a weird thing to, why would he not, why would he stick one foot over the water? Opinions vary on this, but you think it's kind of an odd thing? It's not something you normally see or would, would read about and think that that's normal. Let's do one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. But notice he doesn't say he stuck his foot in the sea, like his foot's down in the water. The most is, most theologians, the, the closest I've ever seen anybody explaining it in any way that kind of makes sense is, it's showing a, a dominance that in his position he has command of the earth, whether it's the sea 
or whether it's on land. Um, obviously, he's in the heavens. It's his body, it's the sky. So he's got command of, of everything that he's in. So, so John is here. He says, uh, the angel called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So the mighty angel calls with a loud voice and uh, he said, tells John not to write it down, resulting in one of the most confounding mysteries ever. Clearly the thunders, the thunders were proclamations of some sort from heaven, seven of them because that's the wording in the text that uh, that's what the seven thunders said. So that's why it says that. And he's, he says, um, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So seal doesn't always mean to seal it in a way that it's inaccessible. Sometimes seal, um, one is uh, Isaiah 8, 16 says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. It means to put an end or finality to them. It's a done deal, in other words. So you're marking the end of a conclusion. So that's an interesting thing to see. But here's, a, here's where things get kind of interesting because I think we can figure out at least what the seven thunders were about, okay? Because we have this elsewhere in scripture. And bear with me while we, while we do this. Um, I couldn't find any commentaries at all that agreed or disagreed with that notion that just didn't seem to approach it at all. So um, I think we have precedence that the seven thunders were something that was said elsewhere in scripture. Um, other often thunders associated with the voice of God, right? And the voice of judgment, we see that. Um, 1 Samuel 2.10, 2 Samuel 22.14, Psalm 18, we have uh, the Lord thundered from heaven, the voice of the Most High resounded in Exodus 19, 19. So God answered Moses in thunder. In Job 37, 4 to 5, it tells us God thunders with his majestic voice, while in 40, verse 9, the question is posed, can you thunder with a voice like his? And the obvious answer is no, we can't do that. So thunder is associated with the voice of God. Um, Jesus in John 12, 28 to 31, um, we read, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. So the crowd that stood there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said and an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world, and now will the ruler of this world be cast out. So again, Jesus is identifying that as the person with that authority and the source of the thunder is God. So then also with the same book in, back in Revelation 6.1 and 14.2 and 19.6, we're also going to have the voice of God speaking as a mighty thunder. This is no question really what the seven thunders is. That it's not just thunder, that it's, it's uh, the voice of God. So this is what John experiences here in Revelation 10. And um, so, you know, the whole thing we every ask is uh, so we don't get to find out. Every preacher, Bible teacher for not the last 2,000 years been frustrated and aggravated by it, saying, well, we don't get to find out. But um, again, not so fast. He says, for one thing, we there's something else that jumped out this last week when I was looking at it. I don't know why I didn't see it before. Um, flip back to chapter 22. So here, John is gets this word here to seal it up. Don't write it down yet. 
So John's, I don't know, he had his notepad out. <laughs> what did John get ready to, to write on? I don't know. But he was getting ready to write it down. And um, he, he's told not to do it. Chapter 22. Let's look how this, this uh, wraps up here. So when John's all done and he's written down all of this about the judgment of God upon the nations, Messiah taking back the world, the title deed to the heavens and the earth. Chapter 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street, either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding the fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there will be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. There shall be no more night there. They need no lamp nor uh, light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Verse 6, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Shortly means quickly, tacos like tachometer, in other words, they happen in rapid succession. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, um, the angel did, see that you don't do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren of the um, the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book worship God. And he said to me, do not, this is interesting, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. He is unjust, let him be unjust still. He was filthy, let him be filthy still, etc., etc. So now, by the time we get to the end of the book, John is evidently told, okay, you can write all this stuff down now. So John gets the pass now not to seal it up. Don't seal this up now. So John wrote it down. Well, what did John write down and where is it written down at? Okay, so let's see if we can crack this mystery open a little bit more. We already covered this here. Just try to... Motor through to the, my computer's being slow tonight, so. Verse 5, it says, The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there should be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call, to be sounded by the seventh angel, angel, the mystery of God will be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So no more delay. So the inevitable great tribulation and the final judgments of God are now about to commence upon the earth. Um, and, and that's what's being announced here. So a specific trumpet call is to be sounded that hearkens what? We've covered this before. The bold judgments, right? Mm -hmm. And also it'll be the final woe. So let's unpack all this. Go to Daniel chapter 8. Now this is very interesting. Are you still all still with me? Mm -hmm. Seven trumpets. Got the angel on the shore and all this. But, but look at here. Look at um, Daniel's vision here. What chapter or what book I was in here. Daniel 8. So Daniel gets this vision and we know 
Daniel is in a couple different ways given visions of what the world is going to be like for Israel all the way toward the end. And he goes into all the great kings, including even Alexander the Great, toward the end. And we're not going to spend a lot of time to belabor all of that. But um, some of these are typologies about concerning um, Daniel chapter 9, right? The, and the man is saying he's supposed to come, the Antichrist upon the earth someday. And so this is where this chapter is beginning to focus. But, but look over real quick. Now, notice that the person speaking, um, the angel that is speaking to Daniel in a very similar vision is Gabriel. Okay, well, let's look. Okay, verse, verse 2, we may as well look at it since we're here. Um, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time I saw it in the vision, and it appeared while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river uh, was um, a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher horn um, came up last, and I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward. So here we've got the visions concerning the king. So Notice, though, that we set the location of Daniel, and he's there by a river. Then, verse 13, I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the sacrifices and the transgression of the desolation of the giving of um, both the sanctuary and the host and the trample to be trampled underfoot? Now, this is interesting because Daniel says he's seeing two people here and one is talking to the other and asking them questions. How long is this going to be? Let's, let's look at that starting in, in verse 15. And it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the, the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Eli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. And he said to me, I understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. So Daniel and John are both seeing visions, both from apparently Gabriel, um, about the time of the end. So that is significant. But now, what does this have to do with what John was saying in the seven thunders, right? So here's our clues of um, Daniel's seven thunders. Because, well, let's do this. So the time frame falls within Revelation's time frame. Okay, it's within the broad outline of the book. When we go to the events that encompass the seven year tribulation, we uh, reread in concert with Daniel's prophecies, a clear demarcation at the middle of the week, um, as Gabriel calls it. So Gabriel refers to the middle of the week. And Jesus is all of it. Discourse. Um, he describes the second half as particularly troublesome. In his words, the worst ever since before that time and worse than anything after. So, by the way, this is how we can conclude that the events have not yet occurred, such as in 70 AD, and are yet future. Because if the Great Tribulation had happened in 70 AD, Jesus either was an error or he was a liar, because both world wars, uh, at the very least, were worse in scope than the destruction and death of anything that happened um, up to this point, certainly better, more so than 70 AD. Therefore, believing that Jesus... Uh, believing Jesus, we see the events as yet future. Also, were these events in 70 AD, we have yet another problem. Jesus said immediately after those events would be the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. So clearly the second coming was not in 70 AD. As I said before, I've looked up the word immediately in the Greek, and it means 
immediately. So it didn't happen in the first century. So this tribulation week that Gabriel described to Daniel, and we see also Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy in chapter 9, all about the end. It commences at the beginning of, um, in uh, Revelation, toward the beginning there in chapter 6, with the Lamb of God opening the seals of wrath. Um, and, and they're described as wrath in the chapter. The seventh seal kicks off the seven trumpet judgments, the seven trumpets, heralding the seven most fierce judgments known as the bowls. Culminating the wrath of God into chapter 19 as the events build and build and build, um, as both Jesus and Paul described they would as, um, as a woman in, in labor. So greater and greater intensity, closer and closer together. Birth pains. Um, they build and build in intensity, Contractions growing closer and closer as well. For instance, in the seals, you see a fourth of the earth is destroyed. You get into the trumpets, another third is destroyed, etc. Well, anyway, we find ourselves in Revelation 10 at this interview. And at this interlude. And uh, by the way, there are also three woes, as I mentioned, that are poured out by the angels. And so far, one woe has passed, and there remain two more woes to follow. So the the placement of the seven thunders comes at a place just at the precipice of the midpoint, right before the great tribulation of the second half is about to start. Okay. And then we also have the angelic proclamation confirms the timing. So let's put these clues together here. So um, Revelation 10.5 says, and and the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what's in it, the earth and what's in it, and the sea and what's in it, that there'd be no more delay. In other words, the great tribulation everybody had been speaking about, right? And what Gabriel told Daniel, what Jesus spoke of also. As we can see, the angel proclaims that there'll be no more delay in the carrying out of the final judgment upon an unbelieving world. Okay, so here I maintain anyway, it seems to me that we have to conclude that the seven thunders have been declared or proclaimed before. Um, look at the, look at the uh, phrase at the end of verse 7 there. But that in the days of the trumpet called, to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God will be fulfilled, what? Just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So he announced these before to his servants, the prophets. So the seven thunders are events that have been de declared before to the prophets. It just, he was just told not to write it down here in chapter 10, but what is supposed to transpire is not um, a big secret that he's not telling us. So therefore, um, the thorough Bible student already knows what's contain, contained in the mystery of the seven thunders without even realizing it. So if you've been paying attention, we probably all already know what the seven thunders are. But let's take a look. So John's vision immediately precedes the Antichrist, and so does Daniel's. Daniel's vision is all about the Antichrist as well. So he's, he's talking about those events. Um, first, take a look at what John, John describes visually. He said in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, just to reiterate, he says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire, he had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And then jump ahead to chapters or to verses five and six. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, and who created the heaven um, and what is in it, and the earth is what's in it, and the sea of what's in it, that there be no more delay. So you're talking about going right into the great tribulation which is the next few chapters, right? So we've got the Antichrist being set up and the beast system and all that 
starting to kick off. So Daniel 8, he has a vision. God gives Daniel a vision in the form of a ram and a goat. There are horns that signify uh, particular rulers, uh, future to Daniel, but great empires in our past that did happen. And um, like I said, we're going to dispense with laboring world history in the interest of time, except for one. The last portion Daniel sees concerns the wicked Antiochus known as the abomination that makes desolate. And that's what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, right? And that's all about the Antichrist. So the abomination of desolation. Antiochus, you'll recall, went into the temple and slaughtered a pig on the altar. He also desecrated um, the holy place by erecting a statue of Zeus for worship. And none of this ended well. Um, but it did historically, so it happened. But Jesus, when he came along, you'll recall in, in chapter 24 said, um, speaking of this said, oh, starting verse 15, he says, so when you see the abomination, abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then, let those who are in Judea flee the mountains, verse 21, he says, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. So note again, this describes an event that's future to Christ, as previously noted, future to us as well, because the worst time in history is yet to happen. We had the World War, so it wasn't the 70s, so something worse is going to happen in the future. But the point is that Antiochus is a type of Antichrist. So consider... Um, aside from what we read in Revelation 13, 14, and also 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, in 2 Thessalonians, remember he says, uh, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless rebellion comes and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. In verse 8, he says, um, and uh, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and will bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So point here being both John's and Daniel's vision, just to reiterate, that's easy for me to say, Daniel's vision concerned the exact same pivotal point in future history that finds its fulfillment in Revelation at the Great Tribulation in the middle of the week. That we, we see a lot of that transpire in Revelation chapter 13 and 14, right? Clue number five is the similar setting and delivery between John and Daniel. So Daniel doesn't yet understand the goat, the ram, and the horns. Uh, 8.15, he says, I sought to understand. The next thing Daniel knows is he's seeing one who looked like a man, and he hears the voice of the man. And he's on the banks of the Uli. What does Daniel hear? Gabriel, explain the vision to this man in verse 16. So Daniel's frightened. He falls on his face. But Gabriel um, tells him concerning his vision that it's uh, the future. And um, as did happen in the foreshadow echo, he says, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Um, so now you could say Gabriel speaks of the end of the string of kingdoms. And that's fine because the end of the earthly kingdoms is Antichrist. So we still find ourselves in the time of the end. So both of these are all focusing on the time of the end. As for, so as further confirmation, Daniel, uh, the angel stands frightened Daniel up in verse 19 and says, Behold, I'm going to inform you of what will occur at the final period of the indignation because it pertains to the appointed time of the end. That's another name for the Great Tribulation, is the time of the indignation. 
So Gabriel then explains the vision to Daniel regarding the primary kingdom influences that lead to Antichrist. So he explains all this to him. Now here's a strange thing. Tell me what's wrong with this picture, because similar to how John was told, do not write them down, um, Gabriel, perhaps the same angel as John saw, probably the same one, says to Daniel, but as for you, keep the vision secret because it pertains to many days in the future. See that in the second half of verse 26? So Daniel was told the same thing. Keep it a secret, Daniel. Well, here he is writing it down and telling us about it. So evidently it was a temporary secret too, just like we have with Revelation, where it's like something to not be disclosed until a later time. So Daniel was told the same thing. Don't write it down. Keep it a secret. And here he is writing about it. Yeah, it says beyond understanding is that for him or everyone at the very bottom. Well, clearly I think it was for everybody. I mean, Gabriel had to explain but it. For Daniel as well, because one of my translations says Daniel didn't understand it. One of them says beyond something. I don't think anybody really could have understood much of what was going on. Because the other similarities are both of these men are, are his beloved. Yeah. To God's friends, he lets them know what's coming, but to his beloved, both of them, he gives that prophetic vision. Yeah. Well, and Gabriel had to explain it. That's why God said, you know, Gabriel explained to him what, tell him what's going on. So Gabriel had to break it down for him and explain to him in detail, in greater detail what's going on, and he does. So, so it's, it's difficult to comprehend how recording these events in the book of Daniel's keeping the vision secret. At some point, Daniel must have gotten permission from God to record the vision and hide the book away for a later time and not blab about it. Keep it a secret means to hold it close to the vest is the way it comes across in Hebrew. So it could be that he wrote it down, recorded it. Whoever would find the scrolls later on would see it and go, wow, what is all this? But he just didn't go preaching about it maybe. Maybe prophetically he wasn't out saying, wow, guess what, guys? And he wasn't blabbing it all over the place. So it could be something like that, too. It's going to be well, kind of hard there's to... Some, there's some conjecture that he went off and did the Magi and whatnot that he had. So he, he would have had the capability to say, hey, don't get this out until later. Yeah. Again, just exactly as what happened with John, right? It wasn't until John had everything. God was done with him, right? And the vision showing him everything that's going to happen in the future. He says, okay, don't seal anything up, John. We'll write it all down now. So he did. Hard to know exactly how that happened, how it came about, how it breaks down, but we, we know that the two books in this respect are so similar, it's kind of eerie. Um, so, however, especially as the setting's similar, an angel on the shore receiving a vision concerning the time of the end, the seven thunders have an extremely high probability of being about what is coming up on the remaining three and a half years of human history um, on the earth during the final earthly kingdoms belonging to the Antichrist. Um, let's keep going here. Gabriel's, Gabriel's heavenly proclamation. <clears throat> so, out of, curiosity, out of curiosity, I proceeded to count the things said by Gabriel to Daniel. So, here's what's interesting. The ESV breaks these things into ten sentences. So, Gabriel's telling Daniel, here's what's going on, okay? Um, the New Living Translation and the NIV put them in English in seven sentences. So admittedly, the correct way to check this out is to go to the original text. And, uh, having an English translation of the Septuagint handy, we see that Gabriel's proclamations also in, are in seven sentences or seven thunders. Um, and that's still not good enough, so if you go take a look at the Hebrew in a linear Bible, in the original Hebrew, the proclamations from Daniel come in seven sentences. So it's interesting. So it comes across that way in the King James Version and the NASB and others as well. Therefore, as John at this point in Revelation has only three and a half years remaining in the Tribulation Week, both Don, John, Don, <laughs> Both John and Daniel, or Don and Daniel, <laughs> write concerning the Antichrist here from their visions delivered by mighty angels. So it may be reasonably safe assumption to make to conclude that because John was told the sayings he had already been given 
to the prophets. Now, Daniel is one of the prophets that this has been given to, and that what the prophet Daniel recorded is exactly in seven sentences or proclamations or thunders from Gabriel um, here at the least of the same message, content, and subject matter. So even if not word for word, the same message that Daniel received, um, it's all content that has to do with, okay, this is what's coming up with the Antichrist or the uh, abomination of desolation. This is what's coming up next in the Great Tribulation um, in, in the very last of days. So in Daniel's seven thunders, it's all about the Great Tribulation, which can, co coincides with what John was told was about to begin in Revelation 10, the middle of the book. Daniel 8, 27, And I, Daniel, fell asleep and was sick. Then I arose and did the king's business. And I w wondered at the vision, and there was none that understood it. So he must have chatted with a couple people. Maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, what, what do you think this means? But he says, nobody understood it. So Daniel was whispering to a couple people and saying, what, what do you make of this? But nobody understood it. So Daniel was told by Gabriel to seal the things up till the end. Maybe this is the gist of what the seven thunders were about, the events about to commence concerning the Antichrist in the middle of the week of years. Um, either in the form of restatement or maybe probably even um, greater elaboration. So here's a nice little handy chart. I don't know if you can see it very well. Daniel 8.20, the ram which you saw that had the horns is the king of the Medes and the Persians. And the second thing was in verse 21, the he-goat is the king of the Greeks. And the great horns, which was between his eyes, he is the first king. And then verse 22, he says, and as far and as for the one that was broken in whose place there stood up four horns, four kings shall rise out of the nation, but not in their own strength. Verse 23, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when their sins are coming to the full, there shall arise a king bold in countenance and understanding riddles. So we know this about Antiochus, the abomination of desolation is a type of Antichrist as we see in Matthew 24, 15. Daniel 8, 24 says, and his power shall be great and he shall destroy wonderfully, it's an interesting word to put in there, and prosper and practice and shall destroy mighty men and the holy people. We see this concerning Antichrist in Revelation 13, 7. He's granted permission to have authority over the saints of the time, the holy people. In number six there, Daniel 8, 25. And the yoke of his chain shall prosper. There is craft in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by craft shall destroy many, and he shall stand up for the destruction of many. This is lifted out of the Septuagint, by the way. That's why it reads kind of funny. And shall crush them as eggs in his hands, which we saw in Second Thessalonians. We read about how by great deceit and wisdom and things, he's going to deceive people. And then we'll see more. We're getting ready to get into Revelation 12 and Revelation 13 and so forth and see the types of things that he does. And the seventh proclamation of the seventh thunder here, Daniel, is in verse 26, and the vision of the evening and the morning that was mentioned is true. And do you, do thou seal the vision for it is for many days. So kind of a clue, we've had, we've had seven thunders spoken to many prophets. There are in, in the Minor Prophets, for instance, there's much more written about um, the nature of the Antichrist and how he's injured, for instance, and what types of things he's going to be doing upon the earth. And then we get to verse 8, Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea, 
and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it, eat it. It'll make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. Most Bible scholars will say that this is the same scroll. This represents the same scroll that the Lamb of God had in the beginning in chapter 6, the seven sealed scroll that uh, is the title deed to heaven and earth. Now, when it, this is how legal documents were done, as we've discussed, when with each popping of the seal, which would be in, internally, they pop one open and then there's another seal inside there. So reading through these, it's a way a legal document might happen when it has details, call them paragraphs or articles in a legal document. And so this that's coming, he's preparing Daniel for, Dan, Daniel, he did prepare Daniel for, but he's preparing John for, is that it's about to get serious now. This is a good thing. It's bittersweet. It's good in that this is the Lamb of God taking back the title deed to the heavens and the earth. Because remember right now, who's the God of this age? Who's the prince of the power of the air? God is still God and he's still sovereign. But because man wanted it, God gave us over, right? So God gave us over and Satan kind of runs the joint right now with permission, with lots of restraints because we have the restrainer holding things back or it'd be, it would end up being what the great tribulation is going to be like and wrap things up in three and a half years. Satan would have had us wiped out a long time ago before we could even see the cross and the plan of redemption worked out. But what we're going to see in the final three and a half years is what it looks like when there isn't restraint and it's Katie bar the door, as they say. It's going to be, it's going to be ugly. So John takes it and um, he's told to take it from the angel and he does. And um, he confirms that um, it was sweet as honey to my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many people's nations, languages, and kings. So it's the day of the Lord. It's about the judgment of the nations and their leaders. This is about the great tribulation. And uh, there's a remnant of believers that are about to be secured, just as they were in the times of Moses when they were secured in uh, Goshen while the plagues fell upon Egypt. Uh, except this time it's going to be um, plagues upon the whole earth, right? So it's going to get interesting. In, in We're going to see in Revelation chapter 11, for instance, what kinds of plagues and things that the two witnesses are going to bring down upon the earth. And it's going to be very similar to what Moses and Elisha did uh, at their respective times when they were upon the earth. Um, this will culminate in the sheep and goats judgment um, at the second coming. We remember we, we read about that in, in uh, Matthew chapter 25. So now's the time to be ready, repent, and follow Jesus for the, you know, the end well and truly is at hand. So we know that the great tribulation is judgment upon the nations. We still have woes to come. And the other woes to come are other demonic things, not excluding the Antichrist being possessed by Satan himself. So questions and comments about that. Did I lose you on some of that? The seven thunders? And Revelation 10, 10 is, has nothing to do with Daniel 5. Daniel 5? Yeah, Daniel 12, 5, sorry. Actually, I was just going to bring that up. There's an interesting parallel thing. Yeah, but this, the interesting point between Daniel 12, 6 and uh, Revelation 10, 5, where uh, Daniel 12, 6 says, The, the man who uh, dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, He asked, he asked, he was asked, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? Mm -hmm. And then uh, verse 7 says, And I heard the man dressed in the man who was above the waters of the river, as he raised his right hand <laughs> and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever yeah. that it would be for time, times, and half a time. 
Yep. Three and a half years. So and then in same Revelation t- 10, though, he says, same thing, raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who yep. created heaven and the things in the earth and the sea, that there will no longer be a delay. No longer a delay. So this is exactly what he said to John. No more delay. This is it. That's, that's in, Brace yourself, John. It's about to get serious. Well, it's in yeah. yeah. But Daniel is a very enigmatic, strange book in that Daniel, most of the book is about Israel and its history, its future history. So we, so we have some of this here. And there's a little bit in Daniel 2, for instance. There's a little bit here in, in um, Daniel 8. And then, of course, Daniel chapter 9, where we've got uh, the 70 weeks prophecy. And then Daniel 12. So uh, Dan, now Daniel 12, the whole chapter is an interesting chapter to read. And, and to, very, very parallel to Revelation yeah, 10. That's because, what I was saying. 12 seems more parallel than in your 8. Yeah. He, he, well, but the, the, the parallels. After, after he says there, there would be time, times, and half a time. Um, and then Daniel says, I, I heard, but I couldn't understand. So I said, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. Mm-hmm. So very parallel to the rest right. of the Right. Visually and the events. Yep. So I, I, I'm sure he's probably a restating of the same thing. But the, the thunders of the seven statements, right. though, he did, in, which is the reason why I ran to chapter 8, because this is where he's told these things and said, don't say anything. But visually, and who the players are, kind of (laughs) same-same. Fascinating, isn't it? No, you're exactly right. The other question I have is Revelation 10, 7. It says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he announced to his servant. Mystery of God. Um, Mystery of God is something interesting to look at, but um, so far, everything that I had read about Mystery of God, aside from a couple of weird woo-woo type claims, because you can always find those if you go out and do research. Um, Mystery mystery is something that has been maybe not disclosed in full in the past. It doesn't mean it was not spoken of. Uh, Paul, when he talks about mysteries, like for instance, the mystery of the church, church and those kinds, yeah. there were verses in the Old Testament that alluded to it and said this was going to happen. And it's kind of one of those things where they, you know, mm-hmm. the prophets kind of said, okay, I don't know what that means, but whatever. That sounds like more prophecy speak. You know, and they just kind of ignored it. But it was a mystery that was disclosed to Paul and he elaborated on it. Well, mystery here is the same type of thing. So the mystery of God, um, most will say, well, this is. The consummation of the ages of God's overall plan. This is even beyond church because the church now is, but it's God judging the nations. Uh, paradise was lost back in Genesis. So now we flash forward here in Revelation where God behaves um, very similarly. We have paradise lost in Genesis, paradise found here. So Everything's being brought back around full circle and brought back and delivered into the hands of the Messiah or he's taking it back and establishing his kingdom the way things should be on the earth and the way things, we know, was uh, um, originally designed, like I say, planned, because there's nothing that happened where his plans were ruined, but he designed the garden and uh, knowing full well that man was going to screw things up because that's what we do best. So... Um, the mystery of God, then, is is the whole plan of the ages. And uh, that's that's why most people... But that's a good question. That's a good... If you find out anything else from that, let me know, because that's the best anybody could do is... Plan of God... I mean, mystery of God. Mystery of God is like more of an all-consuming plan of redemption through the ages kind of deal. And that makes sense to me. That's what MacArthur says. Basically, the mystery is the final consummation of all things as God destroys sinners and establishes his righteous kingdom. There we go. The defense rests. <laughs> MacArthur said it. <laughs> no, but I, that's where most of them go. I have a note there by that one that says Matthew twenty four thirty one. It says, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, the one end of heaven. 
That's going to be the sheep and goats judgment. That would be like at the end, right? Yeah, that's the Matthew, Matthew or Revelation 19. You got Armageddon, Jesus comes back, and then we've got about 45 days there that aren't fully accounted for other than we know events, but these events could fit in there before as he's establishing his kingdom. We, we're, we've got fit in there the sheep and goats judgment. We've, we're gonna, we've got a big, really big supper that's going to happen there. And uh, Jesus is, he says, behold, I make all things new. So all kinds of things are happening in that 45 day period where the tri great tribulation wraps up before we are actually going into the uh, millennial kingdom. Great questions. So, makes sense then? Possibly? Good, strong possibility. The seven thunders. The seven thunders. Now we don't have to say, oh, spoiler, reverse spoiler. <laughs> Why could we? So, seven thunders, same type of thing as we got Daniel, because again, chapter 22, the angel says, don't seal this up. Don't seal them up anymore. Don't seal it up. So, write it down. So evidently he, he did, but I think what it is is when he wrote it down, he picked up where he left off or whatever, chapter 11, 12, 13. He finished up the rest of the book, saw the rest of the vision, what was going on, and he commits to writing down the entire book of Revelation. So, cool? Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the riches in your word. And, and we just uh, stand amazed. We marvel that there's so much to be opened up. And we were, we were told, uh, well, what was told to Daniel is that in the end, wisdom, knowledge uh, would, would become more and more disclosed. And it's wisdom about your word, not necessarily about knowledge and how much stuff and information the world would know in computers and stuff, but knowledge would increase. Uh, these are things concerning your word, Lord, as we got to the end. And I think it's because we have so many things that we can look at now and cross correlate and see how things unwind and unravel. But I think supernaturally, Lord, to your Holy Spirit, it's just more and more revealing these things to your saints that are, have been there lurking in your word all along, waiting to be mined anyway, God. And we enjoy these nuggets of gold that are to be mined from your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to reveal these things to us and um, reveal to us, Lord, we pray when when we're wrong as well and we're way off, off the mark and reveal to us when they're correct. And Lord, we just want to be blessed in glorifying and honoring you for revealing them to us and seeing the marvels of your plan, um, the mystery of God through all the ages coming together at such a time as this, and Lord, that we're alive to witness such things. And for us, as John eating the scroll, it is bittersweet. We're living at a time when the world is so profane, so wicked, so ugly, so heinous. We're just done with it. We're done with the wickedness that's going on around us. And it's evil and wants to destroy your saints and everything that you've established. But Lord, it's also sweet because we know that means the rapture is near and that we're soon to be Take it up to be with you forever, dwell with you. And that's the part we're looking forward to, Lord. So it is bittersweet for us, just as it is for, just as it was for John. And Lord, we ask that you go with us throughout the week. Keep us safe until next time. In Christ's name. Amen.